Hey, Levine, come here, buddy. In this video, we're gonna go over how to teach you to not stop pulling on the leash. Well, we're gonna offer some tips and tricks, I should say. So that's Levine, and Levine is a big dog, and he really doesn't have much impulse control. Now, I spent a lot of time earlier in the session talking about different things we can do to help a dog develop some self-control, um, such as petting with a purpose, passive training, uh, things along those lines. You can search on doggoneproblems.com, search for passive training, or petting with a purpose, the importance of rules, and you'll kind of get some tips for those things. But in this video, we're gonna specifically talk about the leash and pulling on the leash. Now, for a lot of dogs, uh, pulling out the leash is an example or illustration of what we call classical conditioning. I pull out the leash and then something a dog really likes to happen happens afterwards, a reward of some sort. So every time the leash comes out, guaranteed we're going for a walk. And so the dog starts getting more and more excited. And by the time you, after a while you pull out the leash and the dog just freaks out. Now, just like us, if a dog's overstimulated, they're gonna be more prone to making mistakes and listening, uh, not as well. If we're calm and balanced, that's when we can hear and absorb things the best, we can study the best, we can learn new things, we can converse and all that fun stuff. So the first step for this, let's say, I'm gonna pantomime this, let's say that right here where the corner is, is where the leash is typically hung. And this is not the case here, but just for demonstration purposes. So I'm sitting on the couch over here, and I decide it's time to get up and take the dog for a walk. So I get up and start walking, and the dog's like, oh, he's going where the leash is, we're going for a walk. And what will happen is the dog will run in front of you. So the very first stage for this is to practice this, uh, I call the leashing procedure. Now one of the first tips I'm gonna give you is to practice this at times that you are not taking your dog out for a walk. Most of the time, the only time we pull up the leash is when we're going for a walk, it guaranteed means that. Some people think this is mean, it's called desensitizing. So basically I get up and I start walking towards, him. as soon as he recognizes and runs in front of me, I don't say no, I say no through my actions. I turn around and I go sit back down on the couch as soon as he crosses in front of me. And the timing is really important for this. But I'm not upset, I'm not mad. And I sit down, the dog's like, all right, now we're going for a walk. What are you doing over there? Are, are we not going for a walk? And they come over kind of sheepishly. And when they're calm, and if they're too excited, wait for them to calm down. When they're calm, get up and start walking again. And as soon as it turns in front, turn and sit back down. I had one client, this took 45 minutes. But eventually after 45 minutes, the dog realized, oh, as soon as I move in front, we stop, so I'll just stay right here. So we got to where the leash was. Now, the reaching for the leash is also the same classical condition. <gasps> the leash's not going, we're gonna go for a walk. So he started reaching for the leash and he got this far and the dog started jumping up and down pogoing. So he put his hand back down. Now, at this point, we have two choices. We can either reset the whole exercise or we can continue and it's based on what the dog does. This is again a form of operant conditioning. So when I reach the dog, I reach the dog starts to get excited, I stop and I say sit. The dog has three seconds to sit. If it sits within three seconds, then I would reach again. If it doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk back to the couch and I sit and I wait for the dog to calm down completely before I start again. Now, this part took the guy an hour. At first, you get to the point, and so sit, and you sit, then I reach again. If not, go back there. So eventually, you got, you're, at first, you only reach this far, then you can reach this far, then you reach this far, then you reach here. When you actually touch the leash, when I can actually pick it up, the dog usually gets up, I put it back down and say, sit. And he continues, I pick it up, then I try to make it as noisy as possible. Make all the noises, and you can't see him in the shop, but his ears are going crazy. So he's like, oh! But again, we're not culminating it with the actual walk. And one of the second tricks for this is to practice this about five times for every one time you actually take your dog out of the house on a leash. So now it's like, oh. Is this another leash drill? I remember we used to actually go for a walk, man. This is boring. Oh, we're walking. You kind of catch them by surprise. The dog's energy before you leave the house is the energy they're going to carry with them on the walk. So if we take the time, first of all, to make sure the dog is calm before we go on a leash, that's half the battle. Now, I should start with a different step that should come even before you do this. Now, but before, before I get to that, when you're doing this, practice this at times when you're not going to take it for a walk. You have a commercial break get up and practice this a couple times, and then you're not gonna go for the walk, and as soon as the dog like walks in front or doesn't sit, you go sit back down and watch TV, and the dog's like, I ruined it, we were gonna go for a walk, and I didn't sit, why didn't I sit, oh man, I should've sat down, we'd be walking right now. And the dog kind of starts figuring this out, and you take away the pressure that we have, because normally we have busy lifestyles. Okay, I got half an hour, I can walk the dog, still put a load of laundry in, I can call Sue, and then I can get to work. And then the dog doesn't cooperate, and we get very frustrated with the dog. So we take all that baggage out by just practicing when we don't actually intend to go for a walk. So, uh, but before that, this the tip that I mentioned that I'm gonna come back to, I'm coming back to right now, is to exercise the dog before the walk. Most people never consider doing that. Why don't you come over here, buddy? It looks better when I have a dog in the shot. 
<laughs> so um, he's a really excitable dog. Sit, sit. And so if I, uh, if I exercise him first, I had one client years ago and she said, I wish my dog walked the whole walk the way that he does the last five minutes of the walk. Well, the last five minutes of the walk is when he's tired. Mm -hmm. So you take him out and play fetch or something like that. Now see how his, um, his mouth is open now? This is what looks, uh, dry panting looks like that. He's not doing it now, but he's like breathing heavy and they're trying to let the liquid evaporate off their tongue to cool themselves down. So after you've exercised him, really, and if you're doing like the laser like we showed you, or fetch, or running up and down the stairs, really about five minutes should probably be enough. Then you give him about 10 minutes to recover, so he's no longer has his, has his paw down, or his, uh, his mouth open. Sit. So once that's the case, then we would go through the leashing process. Now, uh, so now we've set him up for success in two ways. We've exercised him and taken that top level of energy off, and we helped him stay in a calm, balanced state of mind while we're putting him the collar on. Now he's got a martingale collar that I fitted him up with before we started this video. This is also referred to a no slip collar because it's got a little loop right back here. So when you put this on, this is really a collar that I recommend for this technique just to use just with the leash. And I also only have a four foot leash. The Guardian has a six foot leash. But the, if a dog's in front of you, it's going to perceive itself to be as an in charge of you. So we want the dog walk next to us. So we don't need six foot of leash. Sit. Sit. I said it twice. I know I shouldn't have done that. All right. So I twist it around so the D-ring where I attach the leash is on his spine. Then I take the leash and I attach it here. So this is on the spine and the loop is going up. Then I take the leash and I run it around his chest. It can go down this way. It can go down that way. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is when it comes up, you go through the loop, always towards his head, never towards his butt. Now, this is what almost every humane society in the country uses because they don't have time to, talk, to teach dogs to walk with a loose leash, but they do need to take the dogs out on walks. So now we've got a tool that is going to help because uh, just like babies, um, well, human babies, we, we wrap them up like a burrito when they're little kids, uh, little ones, that constriction actually helps them sit. Uh, feel uh, the constriction helps them feel confident and secure. The same sort of principle applies here. If you've ever heard of the thunder leash, this or the thunder shirt, this uses the same technique. Now, if thunder leash came up with something like this, I don't think that their version is very good. This is a much better version. So uh, this is just a martingale collar from PetSafe, um, and I get the ones without a buckle because I don't want it to ever fail. All right. So the first uh, first rule is uh, I'm going to go over five rules for what I call a structured walk. Now this is not I should specify this is not to teach your dog to walk with a loose leash. This is using a tool that gives you control of the animal that is not the archaic old way of dog training, the old tools like a prong collar, shock collar, or a choke chain. Those are pain causing devices. This does not cause any pain. The other thing, if you have a dog that pulls a lot on the leash, a lot of times it's like, you can collapse their trachea and that's a permanent sort of thing. And it sounds like they're always hoarse, they can't breathe very well. So uh, it just, it all the tension's on the neck. Well here, you can't really see it here, here buddy. All the tension's on the actual chest now as opposed to on the neck. So uh, this is what I call the special twist of the leash, running it around the, uh, putting it on the spine, then run around the chest and then through the loop. All right, so now I'm gonna go over what I call the, my five rules for a structured walk. Rule number one is give him a position. Which side does he walk on? I haven't asked the guardian this, so. Usually my right. Okay, so make it always your right at first. So he knows we're walking, this is where I'm supposed to be. Now I'm gonna show you, uh, come here buddy. Come here, there we go, yes. <laughs> He doesn't like this already because it gives me a little bit more control, but he'll get, he'll get used to it. So the position is hard to see from this angle, but I want his shoulder aligned with my hip. The correction for this is to go up. If I let him go in front, when I try to go up, I'm actually pulling back and that creates more of a pulling forward. Dogs have what's called an opposition reflex. The more we pull them on the leash, the more they are programmed to, they're programmed to push or pull against pressure. So if I pull, he's gonna pull back. If I push, he's gonna push back. So basically, for uh, rule number one is stay in your position. So this is the ideal uh, position. So his chest is not in front of my torso. Rule number two, this arm needs to go straight down and be hanging loose like this, loose like a noodle. A lot of people start walking their dog and they're doing this. They're putting tension on the leash and that's causing him to start pulling. So we're only gonna have uh, tension on the leash for a fraction of a second when we're doing this. So the first step, first, uh, or first uh, uh, rule, be in your position. Rule number two, keep your arm nice and loose. Rule number three, the correction is to go up and down this fast. A lot of people, when they do it, they go like this. They pull it up and they hold it. See how he's bucking against <laughs> it a little bit. So it, the idea is a quick jerk and then taking the leash, the tension off the leash. Come here, buddy. Come. Yes. Who's a good boy? Yes, you are. 
Now his tail is a little bit tucked there, so I probably shouldn't be petting him uh, with that, but I want to make sure he doesn't have a negative association. He just doesn't like this because normally he has a leash and he can pull his guardian. He literally has pulled her down and dragged her, and so we need to come up with a solution. Now, I would prefer to send one of my trainers out to teach your dog to walk with a loose leash so you can stick the leash in your back pocket and walk down the street with, with your phone drinking your cappuccino, but that takes practice. This will give you an immediate result, but it's frustrating because you do have to do uh, more frustrating than teaching your dog because you don't have to do the work. All right, so let me let us know if you want to set that up. All right, so rule number two, uh, rule number three is the correction is a quick pop up and down. Don't hold it at the top and don't go slow. You want to go up as fast as you can and you want to go down even faster, but don't hold it at the apex uh, or and don't stop. When you're doing it, you're walking and doing this all simultaneously. Um, there we go. All right, and then uh, rule number four is no stopping and sniffing. Now, for dogs, they smell the way that we see. And to tell a dog they can't sniff on a walk is really essentially being cruel. But because their nose controls 60% of their brain and they can't multitask, if he's sniffing things, he can't pay attention to you. So we have a bit of a conundrum. So the way that I've come up with a solution for this is I do what I call a one minute free period on each block. Unless it's a really long block, you might do two. But about every you know, five minutes or so, I stop and I undo the martingale and I say free or vacation or holiday or whatever you want to say. And then the dog has one minute to sniff around, it can pee a little bit if it wants. Uh, we'll talk about marking in a second. Uh, and then roll around on something and when it gets done, I put the martingale, uh, the twisted leash back on the martingale and then we continue walking. So you walk and do your job and then once a block, I give you a little bit of stimulation, you get your sniffs in. Now he can still sniff while you're walking, you just can't stop and sniff. If he stops, you just keep going, you let your arm go dead, uh, limp like a noodle and just keep walking. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, so that's a rule number four. Uh, no sniffing, or no stopping and sniffing, excuse me. Sniff while you're going, or sniff during the free period, but not when I'm actually walking. And this will promote what we call a migration walk, which is walking with the nose up off the ground. The fifth rule is no marking. For dogs, um, and a lot of us think, well, we like doing that. Well, you can have a friend who likes gambling, but that's not necessarily healthy for them. It's the same sort of situation in, in some cases with dogs. When he pees, everything between your house and the furthest point away that he pees on, he thinks is his territory. So he's gonna be more reactive. He barks the neighbors on their porches and dogs around. Well, he's saying, I'm in charge, and the other dog's like, I'm in charge too. And so we get a conundrum. So I let them pee before the walk, and at the end of the walk, on the free periods, I guess you could too, but not on the walk itself, and certainly not raising his leg to pee on vertical surfaces. And I walk right next to him. I give him an opportunity, but if you stop, he'll pee on it. Just keep going, and if he stops, let your arm go limp and keep walking. So he can't tell you when to stop. All right, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna demonstrate in here, it'll be uh, probably easier outside, but this will, I know it's gonna be a long video and that'll just take too long. Come on, buddy, let's go. So my, my correction is gonna be a quick pop up and down. So there we go. And if he lags from behind us, we'll keep on going. Pop. See how he stopped himself. So the correction is very quick up and down, but make sure you're going vertical and not letting him go in front. And that's the mistake. Made. Most people make the mistake because they let the dog creep a little bit further in front, then a little bit further in front, a little bit further in front. And then whoever's in front is in charge. And when you're correcting, you're causing pulling backwards on a dog causes pulling forward from the dog. So if you're preemptive about it, you're very quick with the leash and you want to be really have only touch on the leash for a fraction of a second. Boom, boom. <laughs> I know you don't like it, buddy, but you can't drag your guardian down the street anymore. Uh, <laughs> now, some dogs will like say, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to sit down. We don't want to hurt the dog, but if we stop when he stops and he's like, I'm driving. So what my arm do uh, at that point, I make sure we're in grass or something that's not going to hurt him. I let my arm go limp like a noodle and we're just like, we're coming. <laughs> so he no longer has the control on the walk that he's used to. Pop. Now, one last little bit is, again, I'm all about positive reinforcement. And this is a little bit pushing the boundaries of what I like to do because we're kind of using, not doing punishment methods, but we're also kind of not using the positive reinforcement. So I'm going to show you here. Yes, we're going to give you a whole bunch of treats right now. This is going to be your favorite part of this video. All right, buddy, can we get that one? So when I start the walk, I usually have about 10 treats in my hand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take up to five steps and then stop, tell him to sit, and give him a treat. And then I take up to five steps again. So sometimes I take one step, sometimes I take five, sometimes I take two, sometimes I take step three. And if, he never knows when. So you're kind of warming up the walk by saying, if you pay attention to me, when I stop and you sit, I give you a treat. Come on, buddy. 
One. Sit. Sit. So say it twice. When the treat goes in the mouth, say sit. Or when you give them the order, you say sit. And after the treat goes in the mouth, say sit. Let me take a couple more steps. Sit. Come on. Sit. Sit. Now I'm doing this in an abridged version because we're inside. But you would do this as you're walking on your walk. So it's kind of like, you think of this almost like limbering up or stretching before exercising. It's kind of a dog version of it. We're not stretching or limbering up, but we're helping him calibrate and pay attention to us. Usually when dogs are on a walk, they're paying attention to everything but us. But now if we start off with 10 treats. So every time you stop and I sit down, I get a treat. After a while, you'll stop and your dog will automatically sit down. Now your dog's paying attention to you when you're on a walk as opposed to paying attention to everything but you on a walk. And a worst case scenario, if he goes really bananas, let's go and get that one, buddy. Come on. This way. Let's say that he sees something and he goes nuts. Now, I'm demonstrating this just for demonstration purposes. You should not pick your dog up and do that just willy-nilly. But if your dog goes is aggressive and he's trying to attack something, you pick him up, he's got half the traction. And it's also constricting the chest, which is comforting, but also restricts a little bit of airflow. It's not going to asphyxiate him, but it gives you a little bit more control, and then you can move away. So this will allow you to control your dog as opposed to a prong color, shot color that's causing your dog pain. Sit. We're going to hook you up because we're all about positive reinforcement. So this way, we're actually teaching the dog to, uh, by using some positive reinforcement in the sits to start off the walk. And then every once in a while, pull out and stop for no reason when he sits. Sit. Just uh, the best way to treat a dog is inconsistently, so they never know when I'm going to get one. I would also make him sit every time you go across the street or before you come in the house. So it's just having to practice it more and more. And after a while, like I said, you'll just stop and he'll sit automatically. And people are like, oh my God, your dog used to jump on me like crazy. They're like, what happened? And you're like, of course, I hired David with Dog Gone Problems. He came and showed us how to teach our dog and motivate our dog to do what we want it to do. Come here, buddy. Now that was a pull, so don't do what I'm just doing there. Sit. And why have I already forgotten your name? Levine. Levine. Not Levine. It's Levine. <laughs> this is Levine. <laughs> and uh, this is Levine's roadmap. To, or or uh, this is, uh, these are some tips and tricks. We're going to do the roadmap to success in a second. But these are some tips and tricks to help your dog listen to you, uh, set it up for a walk to be successful, and to teach it to sit when you're on, on a walk. Right, buddy? Aww. Yeah, thank you. All right, stop it.